Well, I want to ask you this question. How many of you just love, 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 love to wait? I mean, you go into the grocery store and you look for the longest line. Oh, there it is. I think I'll jump into that line. Or what about you, um, you know, you go to Disneyland with a family just so you can wait in all those really long lines? Or you're, da you're driving down the road and you drive by Starbucks and you didn't really intend to pull in, but you saw the line was wrapped around the building, so you thought, ah, I just got to get in that line. Or maybe you enjoy going to the doctor or dentist's office because you know it gives you opportunity to just wait long periods of time. Or maybe a good day for you is when your computer is especially slow. No, I don't, I don't think so. As a matter of fact, if any of you f feel that way, I'd like to recommend a therapist for you. The reality is that we do spend much of our time waiting. Maybe you've taken an important test and you're waiting the results. Or maybe you've applied to a university and you're waiting for that coveted ex acceptance letter. Or maybe you've applied for a job and you're hoping that you would be invited for an interview. Or maybe you've gone to the interview and now you're waiting for a callback. Or maybe you're anxiously awaiting the diagnosis of a physical exam. Or potentially, you're waiting for that, just that right person to come into your life. Or maybe you're living somewhere between prayer offered and prayer answered. Or maybe between God's call and God's assignment. Any idea how much time we actually spend waiting? Researchers say that we, we will spend somewhere between three to five years of our lives waiting. When I was teaching, uh, I would begin the school year by reading a Dr. Seuss book, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Anybody know this book? I love this book. And then I'd read it the very last day of the school year because I wanted to send them out with some encouragement for what the future would hold for them. But the book starts like this. You know, and you hesitate to read a book, uh, any part of a book like this to an adult congregation, but come on, you guys know you love this stuff. You know you love this stuff. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself anywhere you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the guy who will decide where you go. And so it goes on kind of like that with encouragement. But then Dr. Seuss also addresses, you know, the more difficult days of life a little bit later in the book. And it goes like this, says, So you can get so confused that you'll start into race down long wiggled roads at breaknecking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space. Headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or the mail to come or the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or no or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting, waiting for the fish to bite or waiting for wind to fly a kite or waiting around for Friday night or waiting perhaps for their Uncle Jake or a pot to boil or a better break or a string of pearls or a pair of pants or a wig with curls or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying and you'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. And so, according to Dr. Seuss, waiting is a most useless place. But that's not how God views waiting. He views it completely different. So we're going to look at a psalm today, continuing our Summer of Psalms series, and this is Psalm 62, specifically verses 1 and then 5 through 8. 
and see what David, who is somewhat of an expert in this area of waiting, has to say about it. And it goes like this. I wait quietly before God, for my victory comes from him. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people. Oh, church of the highlands. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him for God is your refuge. I'd like to pray for us today. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with us? God, thank you for this moment that you have pulled us aside. Still our hearts to receive your words. Speak deeply into our lives, God. We thank you for it, Jesus' name. Amen. While we were on a trip to Europe, my family and I visited the Churchill War Rooms in London, and I discovered that Winston Churchill went into political exile in 1929 after the Conservative Party had lost the elections. And so for 10 years, from 1929 to 1939, he was out of power and out of favor, and these are referred to as Churchill's wilderness years. Anybody ever experienced a wilderness year? I kind of felt like COVID, in a way, was a wilderness year for some of us. But essentially, it was a period of waiting after which Churchill became the Prime Minister of England at the age of 66, and he led Britain to victory in the Second World War. During his wilderness years, Churchill didn't sit around. He continued to write books and articles. Perhaps most importantly, he warned of the danger and threat of Hitler and the Nazi regime. See, in Churchill's case, waiting was not a useless place, but rather a place of preparation for the years ahead. In the Bible, the life of David which essentially we're doing as we study the book of Psalms, we're essentially studying the life of David because although he did not write all of the Psalms, he wrote many of them, and, and within them are, are captured some of the emotions that David experiences through some of the events of his life. Matter of fact, the, as we began to um, study this summer the book of Psalms, the Lord uh, challenge me to read the psalm slight, in a slightly different way. As I'm reading through the psalm, I'm specifically looking for human emotion and how God dealt with that. But we, we certainly learn a lot about the life of David through reading the psalm. And there's a part of David's life that intrigues me. It's the period of time when, when between when David was chosen and anointed as the next king of Israel and when he actually ascended to the throne of Israel. And so it's an, it's an interesting part of his life. And, and so uh, it's, it's in this time period that we discover David's heart, which the Bible says is a heart after God's own heart. And we, dis, we discover that his heart was forged in the fire of waiting. And so we're going to take a look at this time period of David's life. So it kind of goes like this. We, we catch up to the story in 1 Samuel chapter 16, and it begins this way. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as a king of Israel. Now I want to pause there to give you a little bit of the backstory because here's what happened. Samuel is feeling really depressed about this, this event and what's going on because he had a vested interest because God used him to seek out and to anoint Saul as the very first king of Israel. And now here Saul is being rejected because he has essentially 
parted ways from the, the path that God wanted Israel to be on. He became proud and felt like, we don't need God anymore. I can do this on my own. And he, and he just began to go his own way. And so God rejected him. And so Samuel's feeling really bad about this because he was a part of all of this. And so he went into mourning and God speaks to him and says, okay, you've mourned long enough. I've rejected him as king. Now fill your flask with oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there for I've selected one of his sons to be the next king in Israel. And so he does. He, he gets his flask of oil and he heads over to Bethlehem, calls Jesse and says, hey man, get, get all your sons together. And Jesse gets all of his sons and they line up from oldest to youngest. And so he's starting through this lineup of, of Jesse's sons. And he looks at the very first one, the oldest, and he goes, surely this is the next king of Israel. Big guy, strapping, strong, handsome. And, and God says no. And he's like, wow, you know. And God says, hey, don't look on the outward. God looks on the inward. And so he passes him by for the next. Nope, next, nope, next, nope, next, thumbs down. He goes through almost all of the sons of Jesse, and I'm sure that Samuel's like kind of panicking a little bit, like, God, I think you spoke to me to do this, and you're rejecting each one of them, and finally gets to the very last one, and God says no. And he's like, what's up with that? And he turns to Jesse, says, do you have any other sons? Well, by the way, I've got David. He's the youngest. He's out in the fields tending, tending the sheep. Well, get him, call him. And so they send a servant out there to get him out of the field, and here comes David. And while David is off in the distance, the Spirit of God speaks to his heart, and Samuel's heart and says, that's him. That's the one. And so he gets there, and we pick, up, we pick this up in 1 Samuel 16, 13. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and he anointed David with the oil and the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So do you have any idea about how old David was when this took place? A Jewish historian by the name of Josephus says that he perhaps was about 10 years old. Other historians say maybe somewhere between 10 and 15 years old. David was when this event occurred. So now let's fast forward because we're going to have to do a lot of fast forwarding in order to get to the, the part where he actually takes the throne. And, and it's found in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and it goes like this. So there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord with all the elders of Israel. They anointed him king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. So you do the math. He's anointed for this position at somewhere 10 to 15 and takes the throne at 30. So he waited between 15 and 20 years. That's a long time. It doesn't take me that long to get through the Starbucks line or to hear back from the doctor. 15 to 20 years, he's waiting. He's anointed. The hand of God is upon him, but he just isn't filling the position yet. See, the time in between David being chosen and anointed was not wasted years because it's during these years that David killed a giant with a slingshot. He fought in several battles. He married the king's daughter. He escaped being killed by jealous King Saul several times. He became a fugitive. He had opportunity to kill Saul several times but didn't do it. He raised up an army he had his hometown of Ziklag burned to the ground and all of his possessions and his family taken. He, he pursued the enemy in that instance and regained his family. I think David qualifies to teach us a thing or two about waiting. And it was during this time of waiting that David developed the heart of a king. And so one of the things that we see in the life of David, and I hope we recognize 
for our own lives is this, that waiting doesn't have to be a source of frustration or a waste of time. Waiting can become a season of growth and preparation and opportunity to witness that while we wait, God works. So today we're going to examine some of David's writings in the book of Psalms to gain insight on how we can make the most of our waiting place. And the first thing is this. David learned to seek to understand God's purpose for having to wait. Seek to understand God's purpose for having to wait. Lord, what do you want to show me? What do you want me to learn? What life lesson are you wanting to teach me? What are you saying to me in this season of waiting? These are some of the questions that we should be asking while we wait. And here's how David said it in Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be ashamed. And that word in the original language can also be translated anxious. Anybody know anything about being anxious? And he says, do not let me be anxious. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none of those you have that, that you that wait upon you will be anxious. Those who deal treacherously without cause will be anxious. And then he says, make me know your way. See, in the midst of all of this waiting, God, help me to know your ways. Help me to see the point, the purpose, what you have for me in this season of waiting in my life. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. See, David learned the importance of seeking to know God's plan while waiting. Secondly, we learn from David about waiting is trust God and don't try to work it out yourself. Let me tell you something. There can be volumes written about the mistakes that we've made when we got ahead of God while waiting. And it's easy to become impatient and to try to work, do things our own way. There are numerous Bible examples of how that doesn't work, and many of us have examples in our own lives of how that doesn't work either. In Psalm 62, our original text today, we go back to that, and, and David said, I wait before God, for my victory comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. See, after David had killed Goliath, became Saul's armor bearer, and went out to battle with the Philistines, upon returning, the maidens of Israel were singing, Saul has slain his thousands, which I'm sure delighted the heart of the king. But then they went on singing, David has slain his ten thousands. And Saul became very angry and jealous and tried to kill David by hurling a spear at him. And David fled to his house, and Saul sent messengers to his house to watch over him until morning. And when he came out of his house in the morning, they were instructed to kill him. And we read about that in 1 Samuel 19. But here's what's interesting, because while David is in his house, he writes a psalm. And we have that psalm recorded in Psalm 59. And so I want you to get the picture Soldiers outside the house, ready to kill David. David inside the house, waiting till morning. And while he's waiting, he writes a song. And the song, part of the song goes like this. God, my God, I am looking to you. Because God is my defender. My God loves me. And he goes in front of me. He will help me defeat my enemies. Wait a minute, David. They're right outside the door, yeah? They're waiting for you, yeah? But David's writing a song, he will defeat my enemies. And then a little bit later in the 16th verse, he goes on to say, but I will sing about your strength. In the morning, I will sing about your love. 
See, David trusts and believes that God it will be there and he will be his deliverer and he's, the soldiers are outside the house. David is inside the house and he's singing a song. It's powerful. It's powerful. You're my defender. You're my place of safety in time of trouble. God, you're my strength. I will sing praises to you. God, my defender, you are the God who loves me. I think there's a message in there for all of us that even in the times of waiting, even when it seems like the enemy is encroaching in our lives, we can sing songs of his love. We can sing songs of his power. We can sing songs of praise. And I, I cannot emphasize to us that are here today the importance of what we do when we gather together as a church body on Sundays and Wednesdays as we, as we collect together and our worship team leads us out into worship. There is something powerful that can happen in the midst of that time of worship. It can happen. God changes things. It's powerful. So I encourage you as, as, as we worship from the very first chord that is struck here in this worship center to enter in because it is a powerful time of God being able to work in our hearts and lives while we sing. And a lot of times when we're in the time of waiting and challenge and difficulty, we want to retreat from those times. When the reality is when we're in those times of waiting and challenge and difficulty, we should be pressing in to those times. It's powerful. Well, as it turns out, David had a window in the back of his house. And so before morning, he just slipped out the window and went, and went on. See, God was his deliverer and took care of him. David had several occasions where he could have taken matters into his own hand. Once while Saul and 3,000 of his men were pursuing David, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. See, even kings have to relieve themselves. It just so happens that David and his men are hiding back in the shadows of that cave and I can just see the excitement in David's men saying, now's your opportunity. Get him while he's sitting on the throne. Not that throne, <laughs> different throne. And David says, no, I'm not going to do it. See, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands. He trusted God. He trusted God. See, David's experiences also teach us that during times of waiting, we should be renewed and find rest. I find it interesting that many times for me, maybe for you, that it's only after our time of waiting that we look back and realize, hey, I should have taken advantage of that time of waiting as a time of rest and restoration, renewal. And sometimes we only recognize after we get out of that period of waiting that we should have taken advantage of that time, but didn't. And David writes about that in Psalm 37, 7. He says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Somehow in the midst of waiting, David was able to find rest for his soul. One of the most vivid pictures of finding strength while waiting is in Isaiah 40, 31. Yet those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And Jesus echoes this in his message in Matthew 11. He says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He's got a rest for us that's deeper than our physical exhaustion. He's got a rest that that speaks to the issue of just weary in our spirit, in our soul. I think there's a lot of people that are experiencing that right now, that God wants to minister to you. Well, the final and perhaps the most important thing that we can do while we wait, and that's this, to seek God. When we're in our period of waiting, let it be a signal to us to seek him so what do we learn as we wait? We learn God. 
we learn him. And here's what David says as he was fleeing for his life in the desert. He says, God, you are my God. I search for you. I thirst for you like someone in a dry and empty land where there is no water. I have seen you in the temple and have seen your strength and glory because your love is better than life. I will praise you. I will praise you as long as I live. And so as we come to a conclusion of our time together today, I, I want to just invite you to be, just to be still and potentially bow your head, close your eyes today listening for the voice, the still small voice of the Spirit of God, speaking peace into your heart. And if you, you are in a waiting place in your life, the best advice that I can offer you today is to seek the Lord, press into Him. And my prayer for each of you, dear friends, is this, that you would have an insatiable hunger and thirst after Him a thirst and hunger that, that cannot be satisfied with anything other than an encounter with God. And he wants that for you more than you can even begin to hope to understand today. And with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to appeal to those of you that have either recently found yourself in a waiting time or maybe you're there right now. And you need for God to minister deeply in your life. Or maybe you're just facing some other challenge situation. And in this moment, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would meet with you here today in a very special way. Father, we love you and thank you. Lord, our hearts are open. And we are recognizing our great need for you. And there are things in our life that no one else can really bring relief to other than you. And so today, God, we're asking that you would touch every heart, minister, move, bring healing, bring restoration, bring insight, encouragement. And while we're thinking about that and pondering God working in our hearts and our lives and we're listening for his voice, I want to make an appeal to those of you that are here today that potentially you've never opened your heart to a relationship with Christ. Can I just say today that he loves you so very much and he wants the best for you. In just a moment, we're going to be praying a prayer inviting Christ to come into our, our lives. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come up to the front or point you out in any way. But right in your seat, with every eye closed, every head bowed, if you want to pray that prayer and you want to invite Christ into your life today, I, I want to invite you just to quickly slip your hand up and say, that's me. I want to pray that prayer with you, Pastor Jim, as you lead us in that prayer. And just slip your hand up so that I can see and agree with you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see your hand back there, over here. God bless you. I see you, sir. Anybody else? Okay, I'm seeing that hand. All right, over here on this side, anybody? Just slip your hand right up. Right. Oh, I see your hand right back there. What a great decision that people are making way back in the back, and there too, I see you. What a precious moment this is for people to say yes. A whole row right there. I see all of you guys. What a great decision. It'll change your life forever. I'm telling you. All right. All right, and, and way back there. For those of you that raised your hand, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. And you just say these words. You don't have to say them out loud. You're not praying it to me or anybody around you. But just say these words. Just say, God, I need you in my life. And there's something stirring in me that says, raise your hand. Pray this prayer. And so, Lord, I'm being obedient to that today. And I just ask that you would forgive me of my sins. Thank you for coming to this planet, for dying on the cross in my place. And I pray you'd put your Holy Spirit within me. 
so that I can continue walking with you for the rest of my life. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Can we just congratulate those that raised their hand today?